The Black Death. Otherwise known as the Black Plague, it's by far the most terrifying of the great epidemic diseases. If you've been to a Renaissance fair, you probably have some vague knowledge about it. Rats, fleas, dead bodies in the streets, and the pure Bergalian triumph of death. It's pretty much the worst thing that's ever happened to our species, as evidenced by the 100 million or so people who died from it back in the 14th century. What most people don't realize is that this mythic disease is still going on today, and that more than 2,000 people get it every year, including a few cases in the southwestern United States. The majority of Black Plague happens in the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa, with the most by far occurring on the tiny island nation of Madagascar, a former French colony that gained independence in 1960. Most people don't know a whole lot about Madagascar, except maybe that it's filled with a bunch of lemurs. But in the fall of 2013, just months before the current Ebola crisis began in West Africa, Madagascar suffered its own epidemic, a major outbreak of Black Plague. I decided to head to the country's capital, Antananarivo, to find out why. The first thing I wanted to learn is what the Black Plague actually is, so I started at the Madagascar branch of the Institut Pasteur, a nonprofit organization dedicated to fighting the disease. We're going to meet up with their expert team of rat catchers who have pretty much the worst job I can possibly imagine. Just like in the Middle Ages, the primary vector for Black Plague are the fleas on Rattus ratus, the black rat. These fleas can jump off the rats and bite humans. To fight the Black Plague, somebody's got to travel to these at-risk areas to catch rats and autopsy them, which is where the Malagasy Plague Unit comes in. So we tagged along with them on a search and capture mission. C'est surtout les rats qui sont le, les réservoirs de cette maladie. Donc euh, à, au laboratoire, nous ferons des analyses afin de prévoir l'épidémie dans une zone pesteuse. Donc on, on fait pas mal de missions de capture. So right now we're setting these traps to uh, catch rats overnight. Uh, they've got what seem to be little onions in here and some dried fish. I've caught a lot of rats in various apartments in New York over the years, but I've never used tilapia. While we waited for the rats to take the bait, I went to go visit Dr. Christophe Rogier, the director of the Institute. What is the plague exactly? It is a disease that is due to a bacteria. The damage on the pathogenicity of this bacteria is still very impressive. It is one of the most pathogenic microbes in the world. The first thing I learned about Black Plague is that the symptoms are fucking horrifying. The most common form of the disease is known as bubonic plague, which is spread by fleas on rats. After an incubation period of three to seven days, you experience sudden, violent flu symptoms. You develop smooth, painful lesions on your groin, armpits, and neck, which are known as buboes, the Black Plague's classic calling card. Then, internal bleeding turns your fingers and toes black, and you start vomiting blood. As the disease progresses, you lapse into constant seizures, confusion, and coma, and then you die in total mind-numbing agony. If the bacterium enters your lungs, it can develop into pneumonic plague, which spreads like the flu and is way, way worse than the bubonic version. In fact, it can move faster than the Ebola virus, and you can expect death in about 36 hours if someone coughs plague into your mouth. <coughs> I, have no, I have no plague. <laughs> I hope so. Oh, they got one. He's sleepy. Oh my God. Look at this guy. Especies one. Ratus, ratus. Ratus, ratus. Ratus, ratus. Yeah. This guy's pretty much directly responsible for helping revive a medieval disease in this country. And he's pissing right now, also. <laughs> 
The next step was to dissect the rat to see if it had the black plague. So we headed back to an open air autopsy table to dig in. God. Oh. He just broke this rat's neck very, very quickly. So now he's brushing the rat to see if there are any fleas on it, which may or may not carry plague. There is a, a flea. A flea? Yes. There's the flea? Mm. Yes. Where? Ah. <laughs> In there? Yes. Is it possible that that flea yes. has plague? Yes, because uh, he drink the blood from the rat. Uh -huh. The blood might be contain blood. Uh, Bacterium. Bacterium, yes, yes. So you work with rats every day. How do you feel about them generally? Do you have any emotions towards it at all? No. No, no. no. There was a time when uh, I loved them. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I, wa I want not to kill them. Yeah. <laughs> but at home, I don't like them. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, you see, they, they cause many destruction. This is a lot more gnarly than the frogs I dissected in high school. We found what we'd been looking for, a potential plague flea. But after testing the rat and the flea, it turned out that luckily this particular rodent was clean. As night fell, we headed back to our hotel room to pop some pills. So this little guy right here is doxycycline. It's a pretty common antibiotic that I was prescribed before I got here. Uh, it prevents a bunch of things, one of which being malaria, but most important for this trip is plague. So my daily routine will be to take this guy and go like this. After telling us how stupid we were for traveling to a plague infected area, all of our doctors in New York advised us to scrub the shit out of ourselves several times a day and hand wash all of our clothes with antibacterial soap. Today, all I had to deal with was getting pissed on by a rat, but tomorrow I'd be heading into a hot zone. When the Black Plague epidemic began, it started in the remote village of Baranimbo, a community of 700 subsistence farmers in Madagascar's rural highlands. Baranimbo is too small to end up on any map. It's 1,000 kilometers north of the capital, and no roads take you across this impassable terrain. Throughout September, the plague raged unchecked in the highlands for weeks before the villagers realized they couldn't handle it on their own. The closest doctors were a day's walk away, and many people died of Black Plague on the way there. After a few weeks, the Red Cross realized what was going on and issued an epidemic alert. But during the entire outbreak, the villagers had no idea what it was that was killing them so quickly. There were several reasons for this delay. The first reason is the misunderstanding of what uh, happening. There was also belief in uh, traditional medicine. This population preferred to look at traditional doctors. In fact, they are not doctors. All the traditional healers died from plague. So at that time, population, the committee said, OK, something is wrong. They decided to go to, uh, to the health centers. We just stopped to refuel in Ambatan Drazaka, a small town in the middle of Madagascar. Two guys drove in a truck overnight to meet the helicopter so that we could refuel because they didn't have enough fuel to take us all the way up to Baranimbo. Uh, and you can really feel the isolation between these towns. It would be incredibly difficult to get to the nearest hospital if you're living in one of these small villages. One of the first responders to the outbreak was Dr. Gatson, a local doctor who was the only person we could find who actually knew where Baron Nimbo was. What was going on in the village when the plague hit? It was commencé par un gars qui avait eu de la peste bubonique. 
Et les gens ne savent pas que c'était de la peste. Ils, ils habitaient loin du village. Lorsqu'il était mort, on lui a transporté dans le village des Anim pour des manifestations funèbres. Et en ce temps-là, que la maladie a éparpillé par tous les gens qui ont assisté, il y avait un drapeau. Oui, c'est ça, c'est ça, c'est le village. We honestly didn't know what to expect. This was the first time reporters had ever been to Baranimbo. We'd even brought along full-body hazmat suits, but Dr. Gatson told us we'd be fine without them, so we took him at his word. The village could have been a desolate ghost town, or worse, a plague zone. But as soon as we landed, we realized it was nothing like what we'd expected. Here covering such an awful thing, but this is a really, really touching moment, actually. Thank you so much for having us here. We were the first outsiders to visit Baranimbo since the outbreak, and the villagers were more than ready to share their stories. While they prepared the freshly slaughtered zebu, we went to meet with some of the villagers who'd managed to survive the Black Plague. Can you tell me a little bit about when you started to get sick? Do you feel closer together now that you've been through this together? <laughs> we got here about an hour and a half ago, and the first thing that we saw was that they slaughtered the zebu for us, uh, and now they've prepared a meal, and we're going to go eat that zebu with the village. Yeah. Never had zebu before, so. Let's see here. Zebu with rice and some green plants. All right. It's really good. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. It's a little, ga a little gamey. <laughs> We're going now with Dr. Gatson to meet uh, a family where the grandfather in the family had bubonic plague. Salam. Oh, sorry. Salam. What did it feel like to, ha to get the plague? How has this outbreak affected the village? We wanted to stay longer, but our pilot saw storm clouds rolling in over the mountains and told us that a severe storm was about to hit. If we didn't want to get stuck overnight in the highlands, we needed to leave immediately. <laughs> The villagers were so welcoming, it was easy to forget that a few months earlier, Baranimbo had been gripped by a full-on plague epidemic. It's one thing to have a plague outbreak in an isolated community like Baranimbo, 
But if plague were to reach the capital city of Antananarivo, the results would be catastrophic. Antananarivo is in shambles. In 2009, the city was the epicenter of a violent, some might say French-backed coup that threw the country into absolute chaos. After the coup, Madagascar was promptly suspended from the African Union and immediately lost the majority of its international aid. The economy spiraled into freefall and the health standard plummeted. Today, over 90% of the population lives on less than $2 a day. The living conditions in the poorest areas of Antananarivo are much worse than they are in the villages, making the capital city a powder keg. Before the coup, foreign aid made up 70% of Madagascar's national budget. And without that money, the country is in no position to defend itself against a plague outbreak. This fact became clearer when I spoke with Dr. Jean-Louis Robinson, the former health minister who was ousted during the coup. Hello. Hello. Hi. How are you? Ben, hello. Nice to meet you. Nice What kind of effect did the coup have on public health in this country? Plus de 400 centres de santé ont été fermés. Avant, il y avait déjà des structures déjà établies, des programmes de lutte dans les dans les bas quartiers pauvres. Pas d'assainissement. Les toilettes publiques sont insuffisantes. Les ordures ne sont pas enlevées à temps et régulièrement. Donc accumulation d'ordures. Et avec la crise, l'argent n'était pas suffisant. C'est un peu anarchique. On our way out, we saw some evidence of this anarchy right outside Dr. Robinson's compound. He's extremely wealthy. He's one of the 8% of this country that lives on more than $2 a day. And yet still, just outside of the gates, there's just all this garbage. We wanted to see how vulnerable the poorest areas of Antananarivo were to an outbreak of Black Plague. So we traveled to Andava Mamba, a deep slum whose name translates to the crocodile hole. If there is a case of primary plague in slum, there will be dozens, hundreds, or thousands of cases. For me, it's uh, the, the main risk. Plague is uh, uh, a bacterial disease, but it's also a social disease. There's a number of factors here that contribute to it being pretty vulnerable for the plague. There's an open sewer system, garbage pileup, a lack of access to clean water, uh, dilapidated mud houses, rats, and just a general level of filth surrounding the entire landscape. It's basically medieval, especially when you start to consider that we're so close to farms and people are living so close to one another. So today we're going to meet up with a guy named Bilo, who lives here, uh, and he's going to give us a guided tour and show us why this area is so at risk for an outbreak of plague. So this pretty much just looks like an open sewer here, is that right? This is a canalization of the water. If you have a lot of water, you can't get it. Would you say that things have gotten worse since the 2009 coup? Yeah. Ati are you scared of a plague outbreak happening here? Yeah. The thing is, if there were to be an outbreak in the capital, Malagasy doctors probably wouldn't be much help. When poor people go to clinics, they're often rejected, and many doctors are too scared to treat the Black Plague. Some misdiagnose it completely. This creates a culture where the poorest people in the country have zero ability to protect themselves, a fact made infinitely more depressing when you consider that the Black Plague is treatable with cheap antibiotics. Two primary cases arrived in uh, big hospitals of Antananarivo. And at each time, it was very difficult for the staff, medical staff, to manage it. We have seen that uh, physicians or nurses prefer to dismiss than to treat people. It was some panic, in fact, in the medical staff to, to do the, the things appropriately. In December 2013, Madagascar had a democratic election. And now, foreign aid has begun to trickle back into the country. But it's an open question whether or not that aid will get to those who need it most in time. 
there is an urgent need for funding the control of this neglected disease. And it is a neglected disease in neglected areas where no politicians is going, where no physicians wants to go because it's too remote. A neglected disease in a neglected area is very dangerous for the population, but because people are moving, in fact, it is dangerous for everybody. The reality is that this is exactly how the Ebola virus spread throughout West Africa. Belief in old practices, rampant misinformation, and apathetic, corrupt politicians have combined to make the current outbreak much more widespread than it should be. For Madagascar, though, it's unknown how many people will die of plague before things start to change. There's no easy answer, but it's clear that the cutting of international aid has encouraged the spread of the disease. On the one hand, first world creditor nations should set standards and deny aid to regimes that undermine democracy. But on the other, there's a human cost to cutting that aid. And in Madagascar's case, it's the revival of a medieval disease. We're not in the Middle Ages anymore. Every death from this disease is entirely preventable, which makes the horror much more cutting. Ta 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 ta